networking and cyber. Uh, uh, let us all welcome. Good morning, sir. Uh, let us also welcome Mr. Steve Carpula. Sir, good morning, sir. Can you hear me, sir? Uh, good morning, sir. You may share your screen now, please. Mr. Steve. Mr. Steve, good morning. Uh, sir, I think you are uh, mute. Here we go. Yes. Good. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Loud and clear. Okay, loud and clear. Very good. Let Thank me you, see sir. if I can. Let me see if I can get a presentation up to begin. Sure, sir. Can you see that? You can uh, see yes, that sir. presentation. Yes, sir. Perfect. Yes. May go full screen. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. You may continue, sir. Thank you. Okay. Well. If you had any questions for me, I could take them now or we can do it afterwards. Uh, my plan here is to give you a uh, presentation and then a short demonstration of the product. So if that's in line with your agenda, I will begin. Yes, sir. You may now begin, sir. Thank you. Okay. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the RidgeBot Security Webinar. Uh, today, I'm going to introduce you to the first cybersecurity robot that can perform penetration testing almost entirely without human intervention. To get started, we'll have a quick presentation, as I mentioned, so you can understand how RidgeBot works and what it can do for you. And then next, we'll have a short demonstration so you can see it in action. During this presentation, I'm going to try to answer three questions. Uh, why should you care about penetration testing? How does RidgeBot work? And what can RidgeBot do for you? So let's start with the first bullet. Why should you care about penetration testing? And to ensure that we're all on the same page, I will define penetration testing as the practice of testing computer systems, networks, and web applications to find security vulnerabilities that an attacker could exploit. Now, exploit is a key word which differentiates penetration testing from vulnerability scanning. We'll discuss this difference in the latter part of the presentation, but we still need to provide you an answer as to why you should care about penetration testing. If you're like most security professionals, you have probably spent millions of dollars to defend your network, but the bad guys are still getting in. And the senior staff is probably asking you, when are you gonna have this under control? But the hard truth is that the more tools you buy, the busier you become. Vulnerability scanners, for example, routinely find thousands of vulnerabilities, but you don't have the time or the staff to fix all the high-risk vulnerabilities, let alone the medium and low-risk vulnerabilities. The bottom line is this. You need to find a solution that can find the vulnerabilities that are actually being exploited. There's an old saying, you have to think like a criminal to catch a criminal. And that saying is doubly true for hackers because hackers are logical and methodical. When they find a vulnerability, they will exploit it and then move on to the next vulnerability and the next, diving deeper and deeper into your network. But we are not thinking in those terms. Instead, we are investing large sums of money to buy defensive technologies designed to block a hacker from ever entering your network. And we are trying our hardest to cover all the possible entry points. But all it takes is one vulnerability and it's game over. Therefore, we need to rethink our strategy and we should start by thinking like a hacker. 
A major reason why our defensives have been so inadequate is that historically, we've had a different mindset than an attacker. 20 years ago, the philosophy was to build perimeter firewalls around our networks. So the focus was on firewalls, IDSs, and antivirus. This is when our defenses were hard on the outside, but soft in the middle. If the hacker breached the perimeter, he could do almost anything he wanted. 10 years ago came capitulation. We basically gave up trying to keep the bad guys out and essentially installed alarm systems. The philosophy was that if we couldn't stop them, we should at least know they are in our network as soon as possible. Hence, breach detection, incident response, endpoint protection, and SIMs became very popular. But this wasn't very satisfying either because hackers often defeated these systems and there were many false alarms. Furthermore, it was a reactive approach to security, sort of like firefighters rushing to the next fire. There is never a guarantee that the firefighters will arrive in time to save the building, or in our case, prevent data loss. The future of security is an offensive approach to defending the network. This requires us to think like a hacker and to build automation tools that can intelligently and iteratively launch real world attacks against the network. The goal is to identify and fix the vulnerabilities that a hacker could plausibly, plausibly use to penetrate the network. Notice the word plausibly. There are a lot of vulnerabilities out there, but only about three to 7% of them are actually used to launch attacks. Ridgebot finds the plausible or likely vulnerabilities. Now, Gartner has tried to capture the transition of technologies over time on this Mr. chart. Steve, uh, sorry to interrupt. I think there's a uh, window blocking on the presentation. Oh, this little guy here. Let me see if yes, I can do sir. Move can you minimize it? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You may continue. Thank you. Right. Sorry about that. Thanks for showing, for bringing that up. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, sir. Uh, it is interesting to note that two technologies have morphed into the future. Breach and attack simulation, which is on the left side of the chart, is not now called network penetration tools. And risk-based vulnerability management, again on the left, is called vulnerability assessment. Ridgebot is leading this transition, transitioning with pioneering work in the emerging field of automated penetration testing. This technology is designed to find that 3% of vulnerabilities that are critical to your network. Okay, why isn't the slide moving? No. Sorry here, a little technical issue. I'm trying to get the next slide. Yeah. I think you may continue, sir. Well, I'm trying. Um, it's not letting me advance the next slide. Uh, let's see. Well, it just, it just, uh, Disconnected. It didn't like me moving that window, I guess. Let me see if I can reconnect here. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, let's see. Let's see if this will work. Okay. Let's see if it works. I'm gonna just, I guess it doesn't like this window move too far away. I'm gonna to try to keep it at the bottom. Yes, please, uh, sir. If, you're, if you're still using legacy vulnerability scanners, you are probably overwhelmed by the time and the cost it takes to use these tools. For example, vulner, vulnerability scanners are notorious for producing thousands of vulnerabilities 
that overwhelm IT departments. Most IT managers don't have the time to fix all the high-risk vulnerabilities, let alone the medium and low-risk vulnerabilities. Furthermore, they have no idea which CVSSs are actually being exploited in the wild. Many of them could be in the low risk or medium risk category. Nevertheless, they try to patch as many high risk vulnerabilities as they can, and they hope for the best. RidgeBot takes the uncertainty out of the equation. It finds the vulnerabilities that can be exploited in your environment. It finds the red area on the bottom of the chart. And I'm talking about this chart down here it's the red area. These are the exploited vulnerabilities that are being exploited in the wild. And these are the vulnerabilities in your environment. It's the overlap that you have to worry about. And they, those are the key vulnerabilities that RidgeBot finds for you. And when it finds it, it provides the proof that these vulnerabilities can indeed threaten your network. And it gives you peace of mind when you mitigate these threats. Yeah, it's not liking this. Well, for some reason I am not able to advance my slides. Interesting. When comparing RidgeBot to manual testing, the differences are glaring. I won't read this chart to you, but I'd like to make two points. For starters, RidgeBot never complains. It can run continuously or on demand or on a scheduled basis or when a specific event occurs. It is very hard to free up skilled security experts to run tests as frequently as RidgeBot. The second point I'd like to make is that productivity is consistently higher with automated testing, and it varies greatly by individual. One of the problems with manual penetration tests is that it requires highly skilled personnel. Let's move this out of the way. And while one pen tester may be comfortable testing PHP with a SQL backend, they may not be as comfortable with, for example, Ruby on Rails or the new framework such as Vue or React. As a result, you can get very inconsistent results with manual testing. It all depends on the tester's skill, knowledge, determination, and available time. Oh, this is fun. Let's quickly review how RidgeBot works. And I think if I can, there we go. RidgeBot can be deployed either as an appliance or a virtual machine. To run a, penetra to run a penetration test, you simply connect RidgeBot to the network and give it a range of IP addresses to test. You start the test by either hitting the run now button or by scheduling a task. When RidgeBot starts, it will build a database of assets, their operating systems, services, network protocols, open ports, network topology, reachable IP addresses, vulnerabilities, and the list goes on. This process is called fingerprinting. Once it has the fingerprints, it uses artificial intelligence to launch iterative multi-vectored attacks. The primary goal of RidgeBot is to let escalate its privileges and access sensitive information. Ultimately, it is trying to gain administrative access, just like a real hacker. A key feature of RidgeBot is it generates a comprehensive report detailing the vulnerabilities it has found and how they were exploited. I'll show you that report later in the, uh, in the demonstration. Now let's look deeper into RidgeBot's core technologies. Starting with the discovery phase up here in the right-hand corner, RidgeBot works like many other scanners in the market, but it has some important innovations in asset profiling, smart crawling, and weak link searches. 
These enhancements provide a more comprehensive database of the attack surface that it can exploit. Ridgebot develops a list of attack strategies. This allows Ridgebot to acquire the real-time information that it uses to generate new attack strategies. The goal is to move deeper into the network. What I forgot here, on, uh, under scanning, Ridgebot is really different in that it ex exploits the suspected vulnerabilities. Most vendors will only list the vulnerabilities that is found with their scans without actually trying to exploit the vulnerability. In other words, they make a single pass and they don't validate that the vulnerability is exploitable. The other thing that Ridgebot can do is it can um, do post-exploitation. In other words, after it has taken over an IP address, it will try to escalate its privileges and move laterally within the network. And I'll actually show you a kill chain where that's occurring. Uh, for some reason, it doesn't, okay. Ridgebot has three backend systems, Ridge Intelligence, Ridge Brain, and Ridgebot. Ridgebot contains one of the world's largest exploit databases, which borrows from open community findings, third-party intelligence, and Ridge Security's own global research. Ridge Security has deployed a large number of nodes and regions where attacks are prolific. Ridge Brain uses artificial intelligence to determine how to exploit a vulnerability. It is in a feedback loop with RidgeBot, so it can cause real-time data to modify an exploit and probe deeper into the network. Ridge Intelligence contains dozens of modules that are highlighted at the bottom of this slide. Things like threat intelligence, vulnerability intelligence, fingerprint rules, and privilege escalation procedures. Okay, let's talk about what Ridgebot can do for you. Ridgebot can help most enterprises, organizations, web application teams, developer ops, DevOps, security ops, ISVs, anyone responsible for security uh, to affordably and efficiently test their systems. It can also be used to perform continuous security testing for DevOps and security ops that are needed to ensure the security of each new software release. You can use it to score your blue team and adjust your security policies based on Ridgebot's recommendations. You can provide a test report to satisfy your compliance auditors, and you can assist your security team in incident response. Ridgebot has several value propositions that distinguish it from other vendors. First of all, it's automated and continuous. You can set up Ridgebot to run at pre-selected times so it won't interfere with your network operations. And you can schedule Ridgebot to run on a recurring basis to comply with security audits. Ridgebot is agentless and plug and play. Agents do not have to be preloaded pre pre before it runs. As I said, it is plug and play. Ridgebot provides full attack path visibility. It provides the entire kill chain for every successful attack. It also provides a description of the vulnerability and how it was exploited in each step of the attack. Ridgebot does not stop at the first exploit it discovers. It will use all the possible information it has discovered to see if other exploits are possible. This is called iterative attacks. There are zero false positives with Ridgebot. When Ridgebot says there is a vulnerability, we provide proof of the vulnerability. We provide you the kill chain. These vulnerabilities are real because the host was compromised and or sensitive data was actually accessed.
RidgeBot is a fully automated penetra penetration testing tool. It automates the discovery of assets, open ports, URLs, attack surfaces, and vulnerabilities. It analyzes each vulnerability and generates one or more attack strategies. And it iteratively repeats this process as additional vulnerabilities are discovered. And I'll show you a kill chain uh, when we do a demo to, to show you this. You can also schedule the penetration to a test to occur at a future time or on a recurring basis or when a specific event is detected. RidgeBot can also be positioned as either an insider threat, focusing on vulnerabilities discovered in your internal network, or it can launch from outside of your network, focusing on your organization's websites, file shares, or services hosted in your public cloud or content delivery network. Now, this does not preclude it, preclude it from entering your network if a su suitable vulnerability is discovered. RidgeBot has a five-layer topology that shows open ports, web URLs, attack surfaces, vulnerabilities, and a calculated risk score. The full attack path is visible for every risk. At the bottom of the screenshot are real-time actions RidgeBot is engaged in, and I'll show you that in the demo as well. These include things like discovery, scanning, and exploits. Now, a risk is defined as an exploit when it has a complete kill chain. You can see an example of this on the right side of the chart. The steps in the kill chain show the vulnerabilities encountered and the exploits that either compromise the host and or exposed sensitive information. Again, I'll show this to you in the demo. The chart on the left shows the total health score for the devices being tested. It's based on a scale of zero to 100. It is a weighted calculation, ref which reflects your system's overall security posture based on attack surface densities, vulnerabilities, and number of risks calculated. As I mentioned before, if you've used vulnerability scanners in the past, then you know how frustrating it is to be told that you have thousands of high-risk vulnerabilities that must, must be patched. On top of that, there are thousands of medium and low-risk vulnerabilities that also need patching. But on average, only three to maybe 10% of these vulnerabilities are actually exploitable. The question is, which ones? With RidgeBot, there is no guessing. We will provide conclusive evidence the vulnerabilities that are at risk have been exploited. RidgeBot has several controls that allow the user to modify the attack. For example, you can rate limit the attack to make it stealthier. And you can choose the type of plugins you want the system to use to minimize side effects to mission critical systems. Finally, RidgeBot will uninstall any applications or folders that may have been used to carry out the, the attacks. So in summary, RidgeBot clearly demonstrates the potential impact of a breach. It can easily replace the highly skilled personnel needed to run manual penetration tests. It strengthens your defensive capabilities it satisfies your compliance auditor. It is easy to use. Data security is guaranteed. It saves you days, weeks, or maybe even months of manual labor. And it could save you from an expensive security breach. So in summary, we'd like to ask you to contact us. Uh, please look at our website. You'll find a vast array of technical information which should answer most of your questions. But if you don't find what you're looking for, then by all means, write us, call us. We'll get back to you as quickly as possible. You can also find a ton of information on our social media websites. 
They're somewhat fun, they're interesting and informative. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry for the little technical malfunction there. I still don't know what that was, but uh, we managed to get through it. So let me move into our demonstration. Uh, partners, for those uh, questions that you have, you may chat it on our Q&A chat box. Or you can unmute so that uh, we can have your questions or all your uh, inquiries about our product. Mm, I think or we can go into the demonstration. Yes, sir. May I continue, sir? Thank you. All right. So the screen I'm showing you is called our task screen. And you can see it says here's a task list. And the task screen is a list of all the tasks that have been run by various personnel in your company, um, or maybe by you yourself. But before we jump in, you can see there's a whole list of them. I'm going, I've run a couple of them, and I'm going to run this task down here in a few minutes. But before I do that, I want to show you how easy it is to set up a task. And so for that, I will just go over here and push the button called Create. And you'll notice here that there are seven predefined tasks. There is a full penetration test, which is useful if you want to run every possible test or if you have no idea what the target is. Of course, the trade-off is that this test will take longer to run. Let me see if I can just expand this a little bit more. There we go, a little better. Then there is a web penetration test, which is specifically designed for websites and web applications. There is an internal host penetration test, which assumes the assailant is already inside your network and doesn't have to break through your perimeter firewalls and intrusion prevention systems. So this is ideal for insider attacks. There is also a weak credential exploit which as the name implies, tries to crack your user ID and password. We also have a web application framework penetration test, and it looks for vulnerabilities in session management, web service interfaces, and how databases are accessed, among other things in the application framework. Then there's asset profiling, which tells you everything you want to know about an asset, including its operating system, application framework, known vulnerabilities, open ports, attached peripherals, and much more. In other words, it shows you the entire attack surface. And then finally, we have ransomware, which is focused on ransomware intrusions. Uh, it currently has something like 30 entry point vulnerabilities and we'll be adding to this in the future since ransomware seems to be coming, becoming very prevalent. Now, in addition to that, you can create your own custom. Uh, here's a custom scenario. So you can create your own custom test if you'd like to do that. But for this test, we're gonna do a full, or for this demo, we'll do a full penetration test. And all we need to do there is click on full penetration. And there are only two things you need to do. The first is you have to decide on a name for this test. Now, in my case, I just used my initials and said test. Then down here, you put in the targets and it can be IP addresses, it can be uh, web servers, it can be um, basically almost anything that you can think of on, on here. Once you've got that set up, you merely go over here and click run now. Now I'm not going to do that because I've already run a test so I can show it to you. So let me go back to my task list. And as I pointed out down here, I have something called, let's see, STK, that's my initials, full demo. So I'm gonna click on that. And the first thing it does it goes into a live topology. And let me explain this. This is not a network topology, it's a vulnerability topology. 
Now for this test, I put in four IP addresses. The four IP addresses are these three down here and this one up here. Those are the four IP addresses I put in here. Now, what's interesting is I've got a lot more IP addresses up here. So what happened? Well, first of all, let me explain some of what this terminology means. If there's a flag, it means we in fact found vulnerabilities. We exploited those vulnerabilities. We exploited the vulnerabilities. Now it is possible we found vulnerabilities that we didn't exploit and those are two examples there. And there's also the possibility that wouldn't, there were no vulnerabilities and these would be the black and white ones here. But we're more interested in the vulnerabilities that we exploited. And so those are indicated by little flags. And you'll notice that I can go in here on these little flags and I can see the IP address, obviously, the operating system, how many high vulnerabilities I've, we found, how many medium we found, how many low. And we can see the risks that are associated with the vulnerabilities that we actually exploited. And you'll see here that we have a remote command execution. We found one of those. We found a database manipulation. And we also found credentials that were disclosed. These are weak credentials. So you can do this by ho hovering over every one of these and, and just seeing, you get quite a bit of information here. So here we found or exploited two uh, high vulnerabilities and four low. Down here, we had uh, 28 vulnerabilities. Now, the reason for all of these vulnerabilities is that we preloaded it with some vulnerabilities so we'd have something interesting to look at. Uh, I don't think you normally would see this, this high a number in a, in a real world. But what I'd like to show you is, you'll notice here's a little robot. So this is RidgeBot. And RidgeBot is sending out attacks. And you'll notice these, these little beacons indicate the attacks are continuous. And there's a good reason for that. As I mentioned before, most vulnerability scanners will find a single vulnerability and stop. Most penetration testing tools out there will find a single exploit and stop. We do not do that. What I'd like to show you is a kill chain for, I believe it's uh, either, I think it's 196 or 197. I forgot which one I picked. And I'm gonna go here to show that to you. And let me move this over so you can see it. So it's, yeah, it's 196. So here's how you, here's the, here's the little robot sitting right here. And the first thing it does is it has to find a target to attack. And then hopefully it's one on our list, but it doesn't have to be. It could have found some on its own. So here it found a target that we were interested in. All right, moving down the kill chain, it found that there was an open port, port 3306. So over here to attack sequence three, it found a weak password, found my MySQL and there was a weak password. Turns out the password was root and the username was root. Not very inventive, but not uncommon. So RidgeBot actually stores this information because this vulnerability could be useful down the road in another attack. Whoever's the administrator here, whoever's using it may have used root and root in another, another way, as an example. So RidgeBot now continues its attack on that same IP address. Here's the 196 target. And it comes down and guess what? It's found another open port. So now it has what they call an attack surface with that open port. And here's the colon 81. So it cr crawls that attack surface, looking for vulnerabilities, looking for things that it can attack. And it found up here in attack sequence nine, PHP info page vulnerability. It said, uh-huh, I've got another vulnerability here. So it comes down here, knowing that that's a vulnerable PHP page, and it uses the username root and the password root and gets in. And now it has access to uh, the entire host shell. So that's an example where RidgeBot keeps going and going and going. Um, 
we deliberately cut it off here because this thing would probably just keep going and going and going. <laughs> but you get an idea that it doesn't just stop once it finds one vulnerability. It will keep going on that same IP address. Now, the other thing, and that's called an iterative attack. The other thing RidgeBot will do is we'll try to move laterally in your network and gain a foothold on a particular IP address to launch additional attacks at additional IP addresses. And let me show you that. So we'll go back here and you'll notice that RidgeBot launched an attack here. This is one of the, one of the four IP addresses we told it to look at. And it said, hmm, this is interesting. I can, and here's, the, uh, here's what it found here. It found a remote command execution credential dis uh, disclosure. All right, but it went down here and said, hmm, I can launch another attack on this 203 site. And from 203, I can launch another attack down here to the 196 IP address. There's so it's Steve. now, but yes. Sorry to interrupt. I think there's uh, one question from Francis. Is this tool intrusive? Is this what? Uh, intrusive. Intrusive. Yes. Um, it is actually doing the attacks, but you can uh, you can throttle it. You can tell it not to do the attacks. You can tell it to slow down so it doesn't take systems down. So you can tell it. There's various things it will not do. We do know that some things will will crash a system. So we'll find it. We'll notify you, but tell you that we uh, we will not attack it because we know it'll take the server down. So we try to be, it is not intrusive from that. We, we, we put in a lot of safeguards. Okay, so you. let me thank show you. you. Does that help? Yes, sir. That's answered the question. Thank you. Okay, sure. So I've got an IP address out here that I'm going, wow, that's interesting. Uh, it's not on my list. So what I can do here is click on that. <laughs> Excuse me. And I said, show me the show me the attack topology. So I can click on attack topology and I can go over here. And what it's going to show me is that this risk score is 8.2. It's out of 10 here, by the way. And I can go down to get web shell remote control. I can click on that. And I can click down here. And, and here is the attack kill chain. So Let's follow this through. I just want to show you how this works. Attack sequence one, it found the target that we initially gave it. It found an open port, port 22. It went up here and found, again, a weak password in this case. And in this case, the uh, user ID was admin and the password was admin. Uh, it keeps that information in mind. It may need to use that again. Uh, it goes down here and we're still at IP address 210, okay? It uses the current user uh, as admin. It's in a Linux host shell. Uh, it comes up here and there's an, another, it goes through a gateway. Uh, and so now we're through a gateway and it comes back down here and we're now at another target, 203. It now found on that target, port 22 is open. So it comes down here and it says, let's launch an attack. And it found an SSH weak password. It, the password happens to be user. I'm not user. The user name was user. The password was password spelled with an ampersand and a an zero instead of an O. Okay. But we were able to decipher it. And you'll notice that when we can break the passwords, we show them to you. And then we came up here and attacked it and we got access to the host shell on a totally different IP address. So here's an example where we moved laterally through the network and found other vulnerabilities than the ones that were perhaps suspected. And I just wanted to show that to you so that you have an idea of the power that RidgeBot has. So let me go back. And of course, these these can be you know contracted and exploded, and every one of them um, 
has uh, an attack topology associated with it. In fact, you'll see throughout this that the attack um, topology or the kill chain is available everywhere in our product. Now, I'll just take you quickly through the, the rest of this. Um, this is what the system is doing at any point in time. And so you can get an idea that it's either in the discovery phase, in other words, it's discovering an IP address, it's in the scan phase, it's looking for uh, assets or vulnerabilities, and that, or it's in an exploit phase where it's actually trying to exploit a particular vulnerability. So that's the three things you can see that the system is working on at any one point in time. And it's multi-threaded, so you'll often see multiple scans, multiple exploits, et cetera, uh, quite normal behavior. Now, this is a little hard to see, especially running it through a PowerPoint, or not, this isn't PowerPoint, this is, but it's just hard to see running it through Zoom. But there's a little lightning bolt down here. And so this will take you to your risk table. The next one will take you to a vulnerability table. The next one will take you to the attack surface table and we'll move through these. So let's just quickly go through each one of these and give you an idea of what's available here. So we have um, three types of attacks that we are generally interested in. Um, remote command execution, credential disclosure, and database manipulations. So remote command execution, uh, it validates whether you can type shell commands into the console. So let's just look and over here are the different risks. So let's assume that we're just interested in, um, I don't know, remote command execution. So I can just click on that. And it says there's seven of them and sure enough, there's seven here. So here are the remote command executions. I can go down the list, but over here to the right are related vulnerabilities that provide that remote command execution. So let's go one step at a time and we'll look, I don't know what's in this one, we'll just click on that. And here's where somebody got access to the remote, uh, remote shell. I can, so this is the, the, the details. I can come up and I can show a terminal. And this is actually a real terminal here. Um, you can see the blinking cursor. I can type DIR and well, there's nothing there right now. I can try that in another one. Uh, and then I can see the current user, who am I, network card information, system version, process. And then I can also go and look at the attack path. Now, let me see if I can find one a little more interesting. Uh, let's try this one. Is this any, go to terminal. This might be more interesting. And then I can, you know, network card and all this information. So I can see, see exactly uh, everything in here. I, I wish I could, I should have pre-looked pre at some of the information. But so for example, in, in um, well, I cleared it. Let's go remote command execution again. So I can look at one of these related vulnerabilities and click on it. And what that's really doing is it's taking me to the vulnerability uh, table now. And I can look at that vulnerability. I can see, first of all, that it's high. And I can look at that particular vulnerability to understand it more. And I can see th what its rank is. I can see the CVSS score, 9.8. I can get a description of what this vulnerability is. I can see a solution, a reference de information, details, snapshots. So there's a whole bunch of information just by clicking at it on it right at my fingertips. So I can just easily go back and forth between the risks and the vulnerability responsible for that risk for a particular IP address. So when I'm done with this, I can just merely click on the corresponding risk and go back to where I was. So let's look at, for example, I'll clear this and look at credential uh, disclosures. There's 12 of them. So I'll click on that and there's the 12. Now this is pretty easy. Uh, these are just passwords and user IDs, but I can click on it. I can see the actual uh, I, I, ID, user ID, and I can see the password by just clicking on it. And it turns out they use the word anonymous for both, for both the user ID and password. And again, I can see the attack path. 
And if I didn't know what an FTP weak password was, I, I could click on it and go back to the vulnerability and click on FTP weak password. And it tells me that what it is and what the, what the score is, the CVSS score is based on the risk. So you get a lot of information here. Let me do one more. Let me go back to, uh, to, to the uh, corresponding risk. Let me go to what one did we didn't, oh, database manipulations. This is a fun one. So it says we have uh, one, let me close this one off. So there's that one database manipulation. What I wanna show you here, I hope it's in here. Yeah, this is really cool. There were seven attacks. There were seven databases that were attacked and exploited, seven of them. There were 430 database tables that were uh, disclosed. So here are the seven databases, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now we wouldn't be able to tell you about this unless we actually exploited it. And then we can click on one of these and show you the database tables. Here's all the database tables that we had access to. Now we couldn't do that again, unless we actually exploited it. So this is real information. And the view is if, if we can exploit it, well, so can a hacker. So these are the ones you need to fix because for sure these are exploitable. All right, so I think you get the idea. Let me go to the vulnerability table. Again, high, medium, and low. We had 129 high, 90 medium, 70 low, tour information. All right. What I'd like to point out to you, I don't know, how does this add up to? About 300, 100, 200, yeah, about 300, somewhere in that neck of the woods, 300 vulnerabilities. Of those 300 vulnerabilities, we exploited 15, 5%, 5.15%. So that's the red in those, those three circles that I showed you on that chart. That's the ones you need to fix. And so it's very easy to see which ones you have to fix. <coughs> and again, I can look at them. They're, they're sorted high, medium, and low. And I can look at the uh, particular vulnerability. I can see that it's critical. It has a CVSS score of 10. That doesn't get any higher than that. Uh, there's a description, there's a solution, there's references, there's detail. Again, the attack path, vulnerability validation. We will often show you that um, and you'll get a lot more details. So we can go down here and see where the attacks succeeded. These are the, the uh, attacks succeeded. As I said, 15. Here's the ones you have to fix. Here's the IP addresses. They're right here for you. So there's no guesswork. This is a heck of a lot easier than trying to fix every single high vulnerability. And as I, as I pointed out before, uh, how many were there? Let me just go back. Uh, let me clear this. There are 129. So which would you rather fix, 15 or 129? And then again, some of them may be medium and low. So this really saves you a lot of time. Now, let me be clear. I'm not telling you you shouldn't fix all of the vulnerabilities. You should, but this gives you a priority. This tells you which ones you better fix now. And you'll also find out, as I've looked at the data, a lot of them are just weak passwords. So those are, those are kind of easy to fix. You get on the phone and you call the, the person responsible and say, fix that, that's crazy. You know, to have admin, admin for your, your password or root, root. So this is a very easy way of getting your system up to speed that normally system administrators have no knowledge of. I don't know what that noise was. So there's also an attack surface table. So you can see, uh, for example, the URLs, let me click on the URL that are being uh, accessed. Here's the title of them. Here's the, the, you know, the, the get and the post. So the, the post is where you write information, the get is when you read information. You can upload, whether it's uploadable or downloadable. Uh, there's the ports that were accessed. So you can see where your open ports are and the services that are being run on those ports. Now, I've been told that this is valuable information because so sometimes they find ports open that they had no idea. And then you can have site information. 
so you can see, you know, uh, the type the type of uh, s server that's being run, Apache, ILS, IIS, I mean, languages, frameworks that are being run, and so forth. I have a feeling I'm running out of time, so I'm going a little fast. Uh, this is a list of the IP addresses that have actually been exploited, that we have actually cracked, hacked into. So again, if you don't know where that is, there's a whole section right here that says they have been pawned. These have not been, okay? These two have not been, no risk found, but these have. And you can see that there's been a remote command execution on this one, also a credential disclosure. And you can see that there's three vulnerabilities that need to be patched. And if you're wondering what are they, you just click on that and it'll bring you to the, those three vulnerabilities. Here they are. Weak password, brute force, login, SSH, weak encryption algorithms. So those are the, the three. So you, it's very easy to go from one screen to another and see exactly what you need to do. And finally, well, it's not finally, I wanna show you real quickly. This is your task summary. So the first, this is like everything on one page. So the first thing here is a score. This is your health score. Uh, as I mentioned before, your health is either zero to 100. 100 is where you, well, anything over 60 is what you're kind of looking for. Um, we have a very sick system here, but we loaded it up with some vulnerabilities. You can see the actions that were taken or where the system has spent most of its time. So a very little piece of time was sent on, spent on discovering or finding the assets. Uh, spent a lot of time scanning the assets and finding out what that fingerprint looks like. And then the last thing it did is it actually exploited it. And so you can see it spent a good time exploiting it as well. Uh, you can see that it created 15,160 tasks for those four IP addresses. So it did a lot of work and it completed all 15,160. Um, there's basic target information, number of active IP addresses that were involved in the exploits, uh, active sites or websites that were that were accessed. Here's the number of vulnerabilities. I said 300, it was a guess, it was close, 291. And we found 20 risks associated with that. So I said about 5.15, it's about 6% conversion rate. Uh, so 6% out of 300 is not too bad. So you get uh, a comprehensive single slide view of what's going on uh, in, in your system. Now, the last thing I wanted to show you before I run out of time here is, I think this, yes. So every time you run a task, you get a very full comprehensive report and this is great if you've got a compliance auditor who says, you know, are you, are you running tests? Are you ensuring your system is secure? All you need to do is run the test automatically overnight, over the weekend, whenever, and you'll get this report. And it shows you basically everything I've just shown you. Here's your risk score. It's not too good. Uh, 20 su su successful exploits, 129 vul high vulnerabilities, and so on. So all of the things I... I showed you here, uh, you can see the exploit results, uh, credential ex ex exposure. So this is interesting, almost two thirds, not quite, but almost two thirds are just bad credentials, weak credentials. Imagine if you can clear up two thirds of your vulnerabilities just by, by cleaning up your passwords and your user ID. Uh, here's database manipulations and this is remote command execution. So for this particular test. Here's the pen, uh, actions that, that we talked about, whether it was in the discovery phase, the exploit phase, or the scan phase. Here's your business risk summary for each IP address. So you can find out uh, the, the, the risks and the related vulnerabilities. And this is what I was showing you before where you could toggle back and forth between them. You can look at your configurations at a glance. You can see what the asset, uh, assets are that you're running, whether it's Linux or Windows or uh, CentOS or whatever. You can see whether it was exploited, if it was, whether it had how many high or low or medium vulnerabilities you had. So in one page, you get an awful lot of information. Um, 
here's the uh, <coughs> IP addresses that were, well, a continuation of the IP addresses that were exploited. Uh, here's your fingerprints in terms of what's running on these systems, what frameworks are being used. So if you're wondering, you're scratching your head saying, what is that 196 thing? Oh, it's a Microsoft IIS server running uh, ASP.NET. So you have a, you got Apache Tomcat running over here. So you have a pretty good idea. You can learn a lot about your system. A lot of administrators have no idea. Uh, here's your open ports. Again, uh, many vulnerabilities are because ports are left open that are no longer being used. So you get all that information. Um, basically everything I've shown you, you get the uh, kill chains for everything that was done. And we can run down all those kill chains. What I wanted to show you is just that as we go down this list of all the information, let me scroll this way. You can also come down, eh, here we go. And now you get into the vulnerability details, starting with the high vulnerabilities. And they, so these are prioritized by vulnerabilities and you'll get all 129 high vulnerabilities and it'll transition into the medium and then transition into the low. So everything you ever wanted to know is right here in this, in this report. So I hope that was interesting to you. I hope I was able to convey the power of the system and the flexibility of the system. So with that, I will turn the program back over to you. Uh, I think there's uh, another question from Sir, Sir Francis Noel Hernandez. Uh, what is the cr criteria if it is a strong password? What is the criteria if you need a strong password? Yes, sir. Well, <laughs> I'm not an expert in passwords, but the longer, the better, I guess. And, uh, you know, the more special characters you use, the better, I'm guessing. Yeah, I, you know what, what I mean is, how does it determine if it's acceptable that it is already fixed, that the password vulnerability is already fixed, or if, so oh, if it's not already a weak password? That's what I'm curious. Well, you know, it, it uses a dictionary to, to look for weak passwords. And so if it's not in the dictionary, it doesn't come up and tell you it's a weak password. Okay. Um, but the dictionaries are always updated. Uh, so we subscribe to the dictionaries. But, uh, you know, if you're in the dictionary, you've got a weak password. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Uh, I think there is no question. 